Hey guys, well, here I am at this site where the US government tested nuclear weapons underground twice in Mississippi. And I'm actually standing right on the hole that they drilled. So right underneath my feet is where the two nuclear weapons were detonated. My name is Natasha Bajma, and these are my dogs, Charlie and Luna. We're embarking on the adventure of a lifetime, a 365 day journey across America with my Ford 350 Super Duty pickup truck and a truck camper. But this is no ordinary road trip. This is what happens when a disillusioned nuclear weapons expert going through a midlife crisis tries to begin a new career but can't quite get off topic. Radioactive Road Tripping is a travelogue show that documents my transformation from a longtime national security expert to a newbie director, cinematographer, and producer. Hey everyone, I'm in Mississippi in Lamar County near a small town called Baxterville and I'm headed this morning to check out a site where the U.S. government conducted two nuclear weapons tests. Let's go check it out. We're driving to the Tatum Dome test site through the beautiful countryside of Lamar County, Mississippi, notable for rolling hills and dense forests of incredibly tall pine trees. This forested region is known as the Longleaf Pine Belt of the Gulf Coastal Plain. Longleaf pine trees once covered 90 million acres of the United States, but now cover only 3% of their original area as they've been cleared to make way for development in agriculture. More than 30 endangered species rely on longleaf pines for their habitat. Restoring these forests has become a major conservation priority in recent years. Since 1945, the U.S. government has conducted a total of 1,054 nuclear weapons tests, many of which took place within the United States. 928 of these tests took place in Nevada. There were also several tests in New Mexico, a few in Colorado, three in Alaska, and two in Mississippi. During earlier decades, some of these tests took place above ground in the atmosphere. Atmospheric testing was later stopped after such tests were found to disperse dangerous radioactive fallout across major distances. I've covered some of this in my past videos and examined how such fallout traveled across my home state of Texas, but it's worth having this context here as well. The U.S. government conducted nuclear weapons tests in the open air at the Nevada test site near Las Vegas from 1951 to 1962. The first series of atmospheric tests started in January of 1951 and was called the Ranger Series. The fourth test in this series was named Ranger Baker II. The U.S. government dropped a nuclear weapon with a yield of about 8 kilotons from a plane over Nevada, and it detonated at an altitude of about 1,000 feet, producing a massive cloud of radioactive dust. The U.S. government tracked the pathways of radioactive clouds at 10,000 and 30,000 feet across the entire United States, measuring the amount of fallout dispersed on the ground below. 10,000 feet, the nuclear debris from the Ranger Baker II test traveled south from Nevada into Arizona, passing north of Phoenix and over New Mexico, entering Mexican airspace for a time before moving back into the United States at Roldoza, Texas. From there, it passed over Big Bend National Park to Carrizo Springs, Texas, and out over the Gulf of Mexico at Aransas Pass. Before the cloud reached its final destination in Florida, however, the radioactive dust cloud mixed with a storm cloud and produced radioactive rain, falling down on the citizens of Refugio County without their consent or knowledge. Because of this single test, Refugio County ended up ranking 43rd of 3,078 U.S. counties in terms of highest amount of fallout received from these tests. Between 1951 and 1962, the U.S. government conducted 100 such tests over the state of Nevada, dispersing radioactive fallout around the entire country and creating random hotspots like Refugio County as far away as Boston and New York. 
In 1963, nuclear testing moved underground after the conclusion of the Limited Test Ban Treaty, in which the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom agreed to end atmospheric testing. At the time, there were only four nuclear-armed states. France was the only nuclear-armed country which declined to sign. Moving all nuclear tests underground made such tests harder to detect, and thus it became more difficult to monitor the advancement of existing nuclear programs and the emergence of new ones. And this is how we arrive right here at the nuclear weapons test site in Mississippi. Today, Jim Hancock of the Mississippi Forestry Commission is giving me a tour of the site. Some of you are probably asking, why would the U.S. government conduct underground nuclear weapons tests in such a beautiful region of Mississippi? Well, the ground underneath southern Mississippi is full of salt domes. Such formations were considered ideal for nuclear weapons testing in other countries. Scientists feared that such underground formations could muffle the vibrations caused by nuclear tests. The two underground tests in Mississippi were conducted under the code name Project Dribble as part of a larger effort known as Vela Uniform Program. This project was designed to monitor compliance with the Limited Test Ban Treaty. The Vela Uniform Program consisted of a total of seven underground nuclear tests, which were conducted between October 1963 and July 1971. These tests were designed to help the U.S. government distinguish between underground tests and other seismic events, such as earthquakes, and to allow for attribution by locating the test site. The second test in the Vela Uniform series was called the Salmon Test. The device had a yield of 5.3 kilotons. Scientists and the engineers drilled a narrow hole reaching down into the salt formation. The device was detonated on October 22, 1964, at a depth of 2,710 feet below the Earth's surface and about 1,200 feet below the top of the salt dome. The fourth test was called Sterling. It was a much smaller yield at 380 tons, and it took place on December 3, 1966. This time, the device was detonated suspended in the cavity created by the previous test. So what was the outcome of this test series? The U.S. government determined that not only could we detect underground tests like this one, we could also distinguish them from other seismic activity. According to the Department of Energy, the salt dome has contained all the radioactive fallout from the tests. There was no release of radiation detected at the site. The salt dome is therefore considered to be impermeable but that finding hasn't been sufficient to reassure the locals here. Just in case the US government has dug multiple test wells to monitor the local groundwater for contamination by tritium. The test wells are easy to spot by the four orange posts around each of them. The results are well below the maximum safe limit level set by the federal government. Still, it's worth noting that the U.S. government paid out $5.5 million in 2015 for illnesses experienced by the workers at the site during the testing period. The federal government also paid 400 residents who were evacuated from their homes located within a five-mile radius of the tests. They were paid $10 per adult and $5 per child for the inconvenience. They were also reimbursed for property damage that resulted from the explosions. There were more than 400 such damage claims. And finally, the government also paid for a water system so that residents don't have to rely upon well water. If you want to follow my journey, please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you'd like to have access to behind the scenes content and exclusive merchandise, become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Natasha Bajama.